There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another Friday Reads. Unfortunately this one is not outdoors, in case you hadn't noticed that already. It's actually not raining, but it's been overcast all day and I just don't have time. I have a stack this high of books to talk about and not a lot of time to get it edited and up and out to you all. So I'm not going to venture out into the overcast outdoors because it's probably going to rain as soon as I get my camera set up or something. So try again next week. I've had a really interesting reading week, let's put it that way. I have lots to tell you. I've actually finished five books, three of which I can talk about at length, the other two were a booktube prize. So let's get the booktube prize ones out of the way first, because you will have to wait a while to hear my thoughts on those. The Innocence by Michael Crummy, and Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Everisto. Stay tuned, August 1st or thereabouts. Three more that I can't talk about at length, in no particular order. I finished my buddy read with Greg of Supposedly Fun of this gay memoir from originally published 1969 in the UK, My Father and Myself by J.R. Ackerley. I saw Greg's summing up in his Friday reads, or his uh, monthly wrap-up, I think, just yesterday. It was a fantastic buddy read. We did a chapter a week for however many chapters there were, so it took us quite a while to read it. It was a wonderful, slow read. This was a reread for me. I first read it as part of a research project on gay male life writing that I did to finish up my master's degree in English way back in the day. And I went out with a bang, not a whimper, because this is a wonderful book, and I enjoyed it just as much on upon a reread. It was really interesting to pay attention to what I remembered and what I had completely forgotten. So it made it just an extra layer of richness to the reading experience. And chatting about all this stuff with Greg, we're both very busy people. And so we had to kind of limit how much personal sharing, not for lack of interest in sharing all the stories from our own crazy lives that these adventures from the late 19th century up until maybe World War II provoked memories of, but we had a great time. J.R. Ackerley was an out gay male writer in Britain at a time when almost nobody else was out. He didn't write a lot. He's, I think there's about three or four other books and besides this, one novel, a couple other memoirs, and a play maybe. But anyway, he's a wonderful writer. And in this memoir, he grapples with, and it's one of the few times where the verb grapple is actually warranted because he really wrestles with information that he receives about his father after his father's death that situates him in the middle of a circle of gay men in the late 19th century. So was his father gay? And he probes that mystery with the flair of a novelist but sticking so closely to the facts that Greg found the ending kind of unsatisfying, and I didn't. But we both agree that the appendix ne really needed to have been. There's an appendix at the end, so you go right from the final chapter, and on the very next page is an appendix of material that a friend of his advised him to take out of the main manuscript, and his friend was right, but he should have also not included it as an appendix. It's so extraneous and so sexual like i love reading about sex and it was too much information for me and that detracted i think from the power of the way that this memoir ended which isn't the way a novel would end things were not tied up in a bow but then you get into some very deeply much far too personal sexual matters right away and you kind of forget how it ends but i loved it it's a fantastic memoir and i recommend it highly just a couple hours ago i finished the gay british novel rainbow milk by paul mendez and unfortunately it was not a success i didn't end up liking it very much i was really liking it for about the first third and i read the final two thirds over the past week and it plummeted it's a debut novel there was a lot of stuff there was a fair amount of evidence of a literary talent in the making, but this novel should not have been published. It needed about 25 more drafts, and it just drives me crazy that because maybe black queer lives are trendy right now, that a publisher would 
disrespect a writer by rushing a book into print that was not ready for the light of day because it, with about 25 more drafts and a really strict editor, it could have been something. There was a powerful story in there, and when I was connected with it, it's about a gay black man, 19 years old, in around the 1990s, who is kicked out of his Jehovah's Witness parents' home for being gay. And that was in Birmingham, I believe. And then he goes to London and all hell breaks loose for him personally. He's exploring his sexuality for the first time. And like many of us, he overdoes it. <laughs> he gets into a whole bunch of trouble. We follow his life up until maybe his mid-30s. I, I want to point you to, I'm going to link to Eric Carl Anderson's blog review because he loved it. I was really wanting to love it up until I got into the, the final two-thirds I really had been. But I think I might have liked it better when I was younger. I think as a young gay man, we really, and maybe some gay men always need this, but I stopped needing this a long time ago. Graphic sexual depic depictions of gay sex. There are dozens and dozens of pages of graphically described sex in here, and I just was bored by them. The first one or two, I thought, okay, this is too much information for me, but I can really understand why every last little detail of this is important to the main character. A 19-year-old gay guy discovering his sexuality where everything's new. So I was just thought, okay, I'm just going to be uncomfortable because I this is really important for him to be recording this fictional character, to be documenting each and everything he's doing. But then there was another one and another one and another one and another one, and I just thought, you know, um, it's too much. Like, it's not important. There are ways to gesture towards sex that make it much more interesting to read about. I, I was bored to tears by all the sex in this book, other than those first couple encounters. But there would be other gay male readers, uh, other queer readers, that would militate against my uh, distaste for that, and that's fine. It's, all books are not for all readers, and this one was not for me, but more than the sexual detail was... Because I want to make sure that I'm coming across sex positive, I just think that graphic sex, it doesn't usually work in literary fiction, so it should mostly be excised. See my comments on the Ackerley memoir. And don't include it as an appendix. But more than that was the ridiculous amount of detail about completely mundane things that made a 100-page story into a 300-page novel. The novel was ruined for me by how every single possible detail about every mundane thing in the room or in their headphones or crossing their mind was described. Now, the protagonist, he's very musical in that music is really important to him. And at first, I was following him because each song, it would either have a personal memory for him that would, the narrative would shift back to that memory and come back, or he would be hearing a song for the first time and describing his reaction and describing the song in detail at a level of detail that at first I found really intriguing and I would end up bringing the song up and listening to it while I was reading it and that was really great. But every freaking song in the book, and there were dozens of them, were described in that level of detail that just kept pulling me out of the story. So there is a really central relationship that gets formed on Christmas Eve, I think it's in a youth hostel or something, and another older gay man and he end up spending Christmas Eve together and talking and becoming really interested in one another. I'm not going to say any more than that. But that went on for about 80 pages, it felt like. It'd be like every song was, and every little, the dialogue, so much of it was just mundane, monotonous. Who cares? Who cares? Yet I did still feel, for the most part, I still could connect with how important this was for the this young I've forgotten his name already um, yeah I have no idea Jesse maybe the main character this young 19 year old newly out of the closet highly hypersexual is making a deeper connection with the gay man for the first time and it's bringing up romantic yearnings and it's bringing up sexual interest it's making him want sex but it's 
also a sense of gay community that he's never had in his life before. That was really touching. And it was about 45 pages too long. And from there, I he, the book lost me. We jump ahead 15 or 20 years, and no, about 15 years. And everything about that was just really awful. So, uh, two stars. It starts quite enigmatically with a Caribbean couple, new immigrants to the UK and the racism they're experiencing living in a, in a predominantly white community. And the father has some health issues. And it's quite moving and rendered in patois that was quite delightful to read. And we don't really ever figure out, or at least I didn't, who these people were exactly in the story until near the end of the story. But it still was a really an unsatisfying wrap-up. Paul Mendez, I would try maybe his third or fourth novel because I think he could be going places, but um, he was done a supreme injustice by his publisher for sending this out into the world. Check out Eric's review for a very different opinion, and that was my experience. Speaking of listening to music for the first time, here is a qu quick digression. I found out about a YouTube channel that has nothing to do with books, but I have been binge watching it ever since I found out about it. It's called Twins the New Trend. I will put a link in the show notes. And it's a pair of black American twins that are filming their reactions to listening to famous music that they had never heard in their life before. So they're listening to it for the first time and making a video of their reactions. And it is so addictive and so sweet. And it's exactly hitting. It's not the only thing our culture needs right now, but it's filling kind of a, a gaping hole in what's needed at this time, which is something that's not so political, but very compulsively watchable. They're adorable. They're beautiful. Don't get me. I'm not going to pretend that that's not half of why I'm watching. They're beautiful. But... The one in particular who doesn't have the the uh, dreadlocks, I don't know their names, I don't know if they say their names, um, his facial expressions are priceless because he grimaces. And at first I thought, oh, he really doesn't like this song. But then often he will stop and they'll do some commentary and then keep listening. But his grimaces, they're just the most ex incredible facial expressions. And, and it means he's loving it. <laughs> it's like that British... That weird British thing, sick. People say sick when they mean something's great. It's, it's like that. But facially, I love them. I love their videos. And the best one is the one that I saw the first, Jolene. They're listening to Dolly Parton's Jolene for the first time. And it's just, it's, it's deeply touching. And there's something about it that just kind of feels kind of healing at this moment. So check that out. I'm going to link the Jolene video. And then if you want to, go ahead and subscribe and watch all their other videos. Because I have been binge watching all right back to regular scheduled programming and i have also finished the barbara pym novel i haven't finished the whole book because remember more than half of it is like short stories book reviews essays and stuff and i haven't tackled any of that but the 162 page novel civil to strangers i finished in my buddy read with Ange a couple days ago and it didn't end well but it only got really terrible in the last couple chapters and I was really really enjoying it until then so that would be a four star read and I haven't like I say finished the entire book but my rating on the novel would be four star definitely not a five star she introduced a lot of characters at the end that kind of were fulfilling some kind of deoxy machina if I'm pronouncing that right to kind of save the story and tie it up in a way that made me almost want to barf Way too many coincidences, and it was just not believable, and it was just seemed very juvenile. And it was almost juvenilia. She wrote it in the 30s, I think. I don't remember if she fussed with it later in life, but it didn't end well. But it, up until those last couple chapters, it was still a delightful novel. And she didn't have as much problem with the ending as I did, but she had similar issues, but it didn't detract as much. So that happened as well. So those are what I finished. I also have one bail. I read half of this and I couldn't finish it. All Among the Barley by Melissa Harrison. The writing was quite good, very descriptive, but boy, was it a boring book. <laughs> um, the prose was dull, really. There was a, a few sentences that I used as Sunday sentences near the beginning, but then it just kind of got limp, prose-wise, and the characters were as dull as ditchwater, and it was padded, padded, padded. The theme of this week's disappointments would be overly padded 
stories. Like, just a lot of these novels need to go on a diet. As if I'm one to talk, but the characters weren't interesting. There was almost no story. I Half of the book would be about, I think I read 200 pages, and nothing had really happened. Melissa Harrison seemed at her best, to a fault, but at her best with the detail about what it was like to be uh, f- farmers in this area of the UK uh, after World War I. But she also info-dumped everything that she knew into the book so that what little plot there was it just kept getting buried beneath tidal waves of detail and some of the detail was interesting but the novel sucked so I was so bored I gave up halfway through and other people loved it but it was not for me as I said in my Goodreads review what did I say not enough story not compelling enough characters among all that barley since you saw me last, I have started two. I have started this one for the Booktube Prize. I'm just 20 or 30 pages into The Beekeeper of Aleppo by Christy Lefteri, and I will have much more to say about that when I am able to speak about it publicly. And I am two chapters into this 1941 novel from the UK, Tom Tiddler's Ground by Ursula Orange. This is a buddy read with Leah. I'm supposed to be up to the end of chapter three today, and I will hopefully get there. And I absolutely loved it. From the opening paragraph, which is two and a half pages long, I'm just... Ursula Orange, why? Why? Based on, you know, 20 pages of this and and having absolutely loved her debut, I am going to be an Ursula Orange proselytizer from now on. Uh, it's just darling. There's something really snappy and warm about the prose, but she's in that way that's kind of disarming she's kind of going right into various social issues so it's opening one's story is happening in london a fairly newly married couple well off and kind of maybe borderline aristocratic moving into a new spacious home with servants and then the woman's old classmate who is leading a much more middle class lower middle class life in a country bumpkin town somewhere in the uk and with war looming, efforts are being made to provide space in the countryside for children or mothers and children that might have to evacuate from London. And that's the premise. And it's just getting started. And I absolutely love it. I love it so much. And if I didn't make, if I, if I forgot to mention it, I really love it. <laughs> so that's what I have started. And in the coming week, and hopefully even later today, I will start the final of the six books that I am judging for the semi-finals round of the Book 2 Prize, Tracy Chevalier's A Single Thread. I am still in the deep in very conflicted negotiations. I'm kidding. I'm still working out the schedule with, with my buddy reader, Joe Smith, of Book 2 Commenter Extraordinaire fame, but we may possibly start our buddy read of this Japanese novel, Osamu Desai's The Setting Sun. We're going to do a slow read it's got eight very tiny chapters, or some of them are tiny, but eight chapters. We're going to do it a chapter a week. We may well get started this week. I haven't gotten back to her, and I haven't addressed my mind to it. But just so you're not traumatized if I say that this is in progress next week, it might possibly. And one that is starting for sure, Everyday People, The Color of Life, a short story anthology edited by Jennifer Baker. I'm going to be doing a buddy read of this with Heidi of My Reading Life. We are very excited. We're going to be starting early next week. As per usual, a short story a week. Thanks for watching.